Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And yeah, I, I, I'm going to excise the word from my vocabulary as a result of that. But I do worry about change. And there's an interesting story today about landlords essentially killing off the living room in a house share. It's another one of those moments where I feel just just how old I am because I, I, I mean obviously to look back upon the times when I lived in a house share you, you, you well you need to go back a while so we'll begin that conversation with an acknowledgement that things have almost certainly changed a lot since I was last looking for digs but I find that really scary you know I, I, I just that that I have an image of loneliness there that is almost impossible to expunge uh, some of my house shares were with people that I already knew. That's often the student way, but some weren't. And, and I still count among my friends people that I shared a house with in Chilton Come Hardy in 1992, who I wouldn't have known otherwise, and they came from very different... Anyway, we, I digress. We'll get stuck into that later in the programme. I'm drawn also to the suggestion of, of excluding children from school if they haven't been vaccinated. I, I, it might turn out to be a black and white issue and we're all on the side of the science. But there's a little bit of me that wonders whether the kind of kids who are in that sort of household are precisely the kind of kids who need the protection of, of society at large the most. I, 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 a little bit torn on that one. I'm also in, in, increasingly interested in the relationship between the gut and mental health. So while the MMR vaccine story is um, uh, one that never should have seen the light of day, uh, broader issues, more nuanced issues, perhaps deserve a fairer hearing. I'm, not, I'm genuinely not sure. I'll make that clear from the start. But we're going to begin with... A, a sort of curious combination of looking backwards and looking forwards. Uh, of all the things to, to make you sort of spit out your porridge over the course of the weekend, for me, I think it was footage of a banner put up in Manchester in uh, preparation for the Conservative Party conference, which, which effectively called for Conservatives to be killed. Um, it, it was sort of dangling from what, what looks like some sort of gantry or... Or, or pedestrian walkway bridge and it also had a couple of effigies dangling beneath it just to remove any doubt at all that this was when they talked about leveling the playing field after 130,000 deaths view through austerity um it, it, it clearly is metaphorically calling for, for conservatives to be killed you also of course had, had mr farage over the weekend talking about taking a knife to the civil service. Now, what you have to remember, I saw a lot of people who uh, historically would sit rather close to me on matters of decency and probity. Uh, what you have to remember about Farage is that, not, not unlike Anjem Chowdhury, actually, many moons ago, before he um, uh, crossed the line in absolutely reprehensible fashion, because Chowdhury was a trained lawyer, they actually have these people a better understanding sometimes of exactly where the line is between being a bit disgusting and despicable and actually being criminal. So I, I, I saw an awful lot of people getting very excited on Twitter and reporting it to the police. There's no way that Farage was going to be charged with anything for, for employing a, a, should we say, a very deliberate figure of speech. Normally you talk about taking the axe to a workforce. Taking the knife to it isn't a phrase that I've heard before, but it was clearly defensible. And that's the point, isn't it? That's what I mean by this very uh, subtle understanding of the line between actual incitement and simply being disgusting. Being disgusting is not a crime in this country. But of course, the difference between political figures and I suppose, for want of a better phrase, ordinary punters, is acute at a time like this. So I don't think there's anything controversial in me suggesting that that disgusting banner put up in Manchester would be a hundred times more disgusting if its sentiments were in any way endorsed by senior politicians, you know? I felt that when John McDonnell called for someone to be lynched, he was again flirting with... Uh, it, 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 
flirting with incitement, uh, clearly not committing it. But there'd be degrees of that as well, wouldn't there? You know, I, I, I'll take the knife to the lot of them, or I think she should be lynched. No one actually believes that either of those senior politicians intend harm in the context of what they're actually saying, but they both need to wonder a lot more deeply about what a potentially, again, for want of a better word, unhinged supporter might take from those words. And that, of course, is why Paula Sheriff last week reminded or sought to remind Boris Johnson that the, the, the kind of language he uh, employs is often echoed in the kind of vile missives that politicians like her are now receiving and she of course cited the memory of her murdered friend Joe Cox in the hope of reminding him of, of how dangerous it can be to introduce this sort of language to the national conversation. Johnson inevitably is completely um, uh, unrepentant. Uh, quite the opposite, in fact. He's doubling, tripling and quadrupling down on this sort of, uh, you call it bellicose or warlike language. There was one clip of him filmed covertly at conference, um, which I might share with you later, of him simply explaining uh, precisely why he, he will carry on to use this sort of language. And it, it, it works, doesn't it? Because, you know, as well as I do, and I, I apologise in advance if you're still on the Brexit bandwagon because it must be getting very embarrassing and difficult now to to cling on to the to the to the to the wreckage that remains but it's all about giving people something they can shout and excuse them the difficulty of actually thinking and looking at stuff so you know it began with take back control it morphed into brexit means brexit or no deal is better than a bad deal all of these things have been shown to be utterly utterly wrong but still still they cling so what can we give them now oh let's tell them that 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 law passed in our sovereign parliament is a surrender say that again they're never going to swallow that are they mate it, it, it's a law that was passed by a democratic vote in our sovereign parliament. I mean, one of the few vaguely sensible arguments that was made by the Leave campaign was that we had to leave the European Union in order to restore parliamentary power and sovereignty and yada, 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 wang, 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 democracy. Yeah, but we've changed our mind a bit now. Now we're really cross about a bill passed democratically in our sovereign parliament. We're going to call it surrender. And, and so all of these people who four years ago were shouting about sovereignty, parliamentary power and democracy are now being told to describe democracy, parliamentary power and sovereignty as somehow in, invoking surrendering. And they're going to go for it. I told you last week, this is all focus group based. Same sort of focus group results that they got for the lie on the side of the bus. So they don't look back and think, oh, that was embarrassing. We probably shouldn't have done that. They look back and think, well, that worked. And maybe there's one voice in the room saying, yeah, but it wasn't true. But every other voice in the room is saying, oh, do shut up. This is politics. It's not about what's true and what's not true. It's about what we can persuade people to believe. And, of course, if you subscribe to an Irene Bevan school of thought, then the most important thing that the Conservative Party has to do is persuade Labour, as in the workforce, to use its vote to keep wealth, as in the owning class, in power. There you go, been around the houses. How do we... How do we wind it back from all sides? So it, I'll give you an example, and I will, I think, perhaps look at my inbox... A bit more than usual today. James O'Brien repeating the lie in capital letters that John McDonnell said Esther McVeigh should be lynched. He was quoting someone else, James. I thought you said the truth matters. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that you are a staunch Labour supporter. Right? And then I'll read the, 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 the tweet above you. Here you go, from Spike, who says, How about Jess Phillips' statement about knifing Corbyn in the current circumstances with knife crime? Really? And I'm going to suggest to Spike that you're a staunch conservative supporter and I'm going to suggest to both of you that if you'd sent each other's tweets then you'd be worth listening to because if I disagree passionately with your politics I used to think we could at least agree that hanging effigies from pedestrian bridges is unacceptable regardless of who the effigies are I used to think that even if I disagreed with you passionately about politics, we'd agree, for example, about morality, actually, in some issues, particularly if you're a conservative and I'm not, and, and you like to talk about Christianity 
I, I thought we'd have agreed on that, but that's perhaps a conversation for a different day. You've got these horrible, horrible pictures of... Um, or effigies, but the pictures appear in the newspapers of this phrase. And, and you've got a prime minister ramping up military language. You've got a lot of Labour act activists, rather perhaps than politicians, uh, flirting with some really ugly thoughts and ideas. So I have two questions for you. The first is 03456060973. The first is, how, how, how do we dial it down? My naive suggestion is perhaps you dial it down by criticising your own side more robustly than you criticise the other side. But then you look back on Brexit and you kind of think, yeah, but if you do that and the other side doesn't, they get a complete free pass to tell whatever lies they want or to do whatever they please. And that leads us into question number two on this question of, of the increasingly febrile political atmosphere. Question number one is how do you think we can dial it down? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three, and question number two is, it, it, and and I, I don't know how I can ask this question without my own leanings being clear, but if only one side addresses the problem, does that give victory to the other side? Is that why perhaps many of us are not as quick to criticise our comrades as we are to criticise our foes? I, I find it incredibly easy to condemn that poster in Manchester, but I'm already getting messages pointing out that I'm no fan of Jeremy Corbyn. So, <laughs> so I'm not criticising my own side uh, 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 when I criticise that. I'm criticising the extremist Corbynites as a centrist dad. I don't even understand the, the, the mental contortions that people have to go through these days in order to pin a badge on their breast every morning. But I just want you to tell me, as someone who cares, how, how do we dial this down? Surely we can all agree that politicians should stop using metaphorical references to war and violence. Can we not? Can we begin with that? Or does your automatic response, and if it does, just pay me the compliment of taking a moment to think about this. If you automatically, like my early texts and tweets attest, if you automatically find yourself going, yeah, but the other lot. Yeah, but the other lot. Now, here's something disgusting that's been done by quotes, your lot, and your automatic response is, yeah, but the other lot. Then, is it possible that you are the problem. It's 10.17. 130,000 killed under Tory rule. Time to level the playing field. Um, and then two sort of effigies dangling from... I'll tell you where I think that is. I think that's the... Is it the River Urm? What's the river called in Manchester? I think that's down near the... Um, down near the People's Museum. But anyway, it doesn't matter. That's an example of, of, of extremity. Then you have people like Farage talking about taking a knife to civil servants, uh, John McDonnell um, referencing someone, calling for Estimate Vey to be lynched. I, 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 sorry, I must take some calls, but this is such a fascinating question because uh, do you think anyone actually has truly objective scales? So uh, if you take the knife comment there, if you like Farage, you'll forgive that, right? And if you take the McDonnell comment, if you like him, you'll forgive that. I, I, I hold a candle for neither, but I'm, in my own mind, Farage's words seem infinitely worse than McDonald's, but obviously I, I don't think anyone could have listened to this programme for more than six seconds without, without knowing the absolute contempt in which I hold Mr Farage for, for a whole heap of reasons, um, none of which need to be revisited, although I always think that lying about the assassination attempt was a bit of a highlight. 22 minutes after 10 is the time. How do we dial things down? John's in Brighton. John, what would you like to say? Yes, well, I'll, see, I've, I started off before all this, I was a Liberal Democrat supporter. And I, and I, fought, and I, I always voted for Liberal Democrats. And then as, as we kind of went on after the um, uh, Brexit and, and all the rest of it, I... I've then started slowly sort of moving. I don't quite know how I've done this, but I've moved from <laughs> sort of right to, to sort of centre right. OK. Um, I, I think that everyone's... What does so that... What does that... I know this isn't a gotcha question. What do, what do you mean yeah. by that? Because I'm not entirely sure. Um, so also, it's a terrible I'm, phone line, mate. I don't know if there's something you can do about that. 
Is there? Yeah, sorry, hang on two seconds. Is that, you're on live national radio, mate. It shouldn't. I don't want to sound ungrateful, but for heaven's sake, Paul's in Exeter. Paul, what would you like to say? Hi, yeah. Hi, James. Yeah, it's my first time calling. You're very um, welcome. Y- Okay. But let's not um, have a fight, just to get into the spirit of things. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's all right, I come with, with gloves off. Good man. Um, but, yeah. so Irwell, basically, the River uh, Irwell is the one I was looking for, near the cathedral. That's what that picture looks like to me, but we digress. Back to you, Paul. Right. OK, yeah, so you, you were um, just talking about dialing it down. Um, I don't have a full answer to this. Uh, I don't know if anybody does, but um, I think we, um, we need to kind of look at the, the context. So basically... Since, you know, Boris Johnson wrote for the Times back in the 90s, you know, um, basically... Yeah, yeah, well, it was Telegraph, beg yeah. your pardon. He got sacked okay, from the Times for making up quotes from his own godfather. Yeah, exactly. And I think Little that... details. He, Only people had listened he when basically, I was pointing at me. Exactly. He was one of these people who kind of st- um, started writing... Um, um, exaggerating stories about the EU to the general public. Yeah. Times and the Telegraph took that on, they inflated it. Kelvin McKenzie... The, the same in the sun. I mean, it's a matter of public record that he did. He even admitted it on, I think it was Mark Mardell's um, podcast, Brexit okay. Love Story. I'm, I'm, I'm trying know. not to have a Brexit phone in today exclusively, but you're suggesting that these seeds were sown somehow by by that kind of irresponsible quotes journalism. Well, quotes. exactly. I think, it is, I think it's a really oh, big come part on. What about of Thatcher? Are, what, what, about, what, what about Margaret Thatcher's premiership? There was incredible verbal and and physical violence undertaken for political reasons back then and and you, you, you know sort of people who who liked her and people who didn't like her felt their tempers um uh, fray to an incredible degree long before euro skepticism was was mainstreamed i think well well yeah i mean i i i take your point but um the other part of what i was going to come on to was actually the influence of social media because um social media kind of i i feel acts as an amplifier to yeah. public opinion it's I, a power isn't I, it I, well it, again we, i it is but i i mean odd though this will sound i'm reading a lot about um uh, france in the uh, the time that elizabeth the first was on the thrown in this country and it's it's really helpful to read about the religious wars that were raging across Europe at the time the tensions between the catholic league and uh, and the huguenots and then the, the the royals as well like three points of a triangle they they they'd slit your throat for for reading the bible the wrong way round so you didn't need social media to foment ludicrous tribalism and and sort of murderous blind loyalties well, no, but the thing is, yeah, I totally take your point, right? But the thing is, is, is more that we are in a situation now that has basically been, um, you, you know, it's, it's a com- it's a perfect storm of, of, um, of circumstances. Yeah. So you've got social media amplifying what, um, you know, like the steady drip, drip, drip of negativity about the EU, right? Which basically ties into sort of human, there's a human nature there's an aspect of human nature which is quite sort of like them and us. Yes. And it, you know, and it, and I think those combination things have fed that narrative. And because social media kind of like puts us into those bubbles where we tend to just sort of like see more of the opinions that we tend to agree with, it amplifies those, negates the opposite point of view. You know, now I'm, I, I voted Remain. I'm pretty much a Remainer, but I think that there are probably aspects of the leave ar- um, leave argument which well i mean the eu aren't perfect let's put it that way but all what i'm trying to say is that all nuance has gone the 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 combination i think of the you know social media the effect of social media on you know added to the campaign that's basically being waged has got us into the situation where we are so basically the the rhetoric and the um yeah you're right in the past that would have happened but what's happened now is because of the social media it's kind of brought it more into the public um public awareness you know so you're right but um Back in in the 16th century, we didn't have social media. In Thatcher's time, we didn't have social media. But we didn't... The the ordinary people didn't see so much of what is happening in in public life as they do now. Uh, Yeah, I... I don't know, and nor nor do you, of course, for certain. And clearly, as a journalist, there is something odd about that when they started introducing comments below the line and the sort of people that would normally be sending letters to newspapers in green ink 
while yeah. while pursuing lives of, of of almost unmitigated bitterness and loneliness. Then yeah. they started putting comments at the back of the newspaper on on the bottom of newspaper articles online, and they'd get you know five, ten, fifteen, and these days five thousand likes for the kind of stuff that used to be confined to green ink letters sent sent to newspapers. So clearly that validates. And then if you got noticed yesterday for being mildly gross, then in order to get noticed today, you've got to be even grosser. And that seems to me, from a cursory look at this kind of social media, um, that seems to me to, to explain how you end up with words like traitor and things like that moving into the mainstream. So if we take yes. your theory and then apply it to the question I'm actually asking, which is how do we fix this, the short answer would be people in public life, most obviously politicians, but also, of course, journalists, must at all costs resist any temptation to ape the language of the comment sections and to ape the language of the of the kind of um, extremist website contributors. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I would broadly agree with that. I think what it is is that because social media is, is completely changed. I mean, I'm not totally laying the blame on social. No, media. No, no, I know, I know, but, but it gives. It is you know, like but, a massive loud hailer and a massive amplifier. And and you know, even if I took a caller on the radio who came out with the kind of bile that is now commonplace on social media, it would be a moment in time. You know, even if it was clipped up and went viral, it's still a moment in time. But but. What social media does is give the caller constant access to the ears of some of the public. And then perhaps one of the answers to the question, how do we fix things, stop calling it out. I know that sounds odd, but it, it, I, I mean, receipts historically of rather more um, bilious communication on social media than, than many. Not all. I, for a start, I'm white, straight and male. So the kind of abuse I get is automatically not as bad as the kind of stuff that, that, that Gina Miller or... Um, Diane Abbott or others receive but if you stop calling it out, you stop amplifying it. Perhaps just a thought. I, I suppose the first thing you have to do is perhaps and this is the problem because we won't agree on this you need to identify the people that don't want to fix things. Right? The people who actually thrive upon stoking up this febrile atmosphere and that is the point at which any attempts to, to unite fall apart. Because if, if I say, well, so-and-so <clears throat> doesn't seem to want to dial things down, so-and-so seems to, seems to thrive upon uh, whipping up this kind of hatred, anyone who uses sort of comparisons to war when they're describing our relationship with other European Union countries, I mean, that's just incredibly dangerous. But now I've alienated levers because pretty much every leading lever reaches for words like traitor or surrender or betrayal. Traitor, not so much the, the senior politicians, but it's incredibly commonplace in the, um, in the shallows. As soon as you do that, how do you dial it down? I don't know. 0345 606 and, and the other thing you'd point out would be the false outrage. There's lots of false outrage out there. That's what I mean by... I point at something horrible that's been done by somebody allied to something you believe in, and you automatically go, yeah, but what about? Yeah, but what about that? Yeah, but what about that? Instead of just going, God, that's gross. Just today, let's focus on that and call it gross. Let's not respond to it by saying, yeah, but on the other hand, yeah, but on the other... I don't know. It's just me thinking out loud. Because I think, you know, albeit that one has to grow a, a rather thicker skin than is normal to operate in anything close to the public sphere politically these days, it does perhaps give you a, 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 an insight into how quickly the traffic seems to be moving. I don't think, and I could be wrong, but I don't think it was commonplace for senior politicians to be talking about betrayal and surrender all the time in the context of things that had been passed by our own parliament. Ross is in Manchester. Ross, what do you reckon? Uh, well, the thing I think it goes back much further than than the uh, oppositional uh, way that politics has gone to mm. actually being part of the actual system itself. So the whole system in politics is set up so that you have confrontation. Well, yes, there but is... we've always had this system of politics, and I think today's yes. conversation is contingent upon the suggestion that the confrontation is is rather more febrile and toxic than usual. 
Okay. Uh, yes, I was just laying the groundwork for mm. my second point. And uh, my second point is that people have been primed by advertising and the media to receive very simple, short messages yes. which touch upon and reinforce emotional triggers in people. Now, what the current atmosphere has done is it has managed to identify these triggers and use them for their own ends by algorithmic uh, examination of data on social media. Mm. So they know how to pinpoint people's responses. And because of the psychological makeup of tribalism, people only get their own message reinforced. So it's no surprise that the two sides that have been set up get further and further apart and more and more extreme because they're only having their own uh, point of view reinforced and not being uh, encouraged to collaborate to come to a central idea. Yes, you're clearly onto something there. I like the notion of simple and short messages being used as a sort of substitute for, 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 for understanding. That tallies with something I've been trying to describe for some time but I, I just I'm looking at the extremities and I prefer that word to extremes I don't know why yeah. seems a little bit more diplomatic and and they don't what's odd perhaps is they don't turn their attacks on each other so much do they they turn their attacks on on the middle they both attack the middle the the, the you know the the, the the centrist for want of a better position they don't they don't attack each other does that does that add to your um, analysis well, I hadn't thought of it in that way. Perhaps I could be the, wrong. That's just from where I'm sitting this morning. Um, I think they, they possibly attack the, the, the middle because it's closer to their understanding of what is. Yes. So therefore, they're able to construct a position against the centre that is much more difficult for them to construct a position against an extreme because the only position they have against an extreme is an emotional one. It's a very uh, intense uh, reaction to that. So their mind doesn't allow them to kick into a rational set of examinations. It immediately kicks into the fight or flight area of them, um, you know, bringing up disgust, fear, anger, um, you know, aggression, all of those sorts of things. So maybe that's why they attack the center because they can actually articulate uh, that. And they can reach it. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, do you know what else the problem might be? Here's a text that's just coming. I am James O'B's biggest fan, but man, this is the most boring hour on LBC I've heard in years. <coughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should make it short, sharp and snappy. I'm and blaming it like on you. One I'm blaming well, it entirely on you. Much. I'm not taking responsibility. But but there's a point there, isn't there? Which is today we're trying yeah. to work out where all the anger and bitterness comes from. Yeah. But that doesn't make, for this listener at least, and possibly for many others, that doesn't make as compelling radio as when we are either attacking or inflating and amplifying the fury yeah. and, the, and, the, and the highly emotive commentary. People, people want the intense experience. That's why they, can't, they find rationality dull, boring. They want to gauge to it. They want to go straight to the sort of the chemical reinforced high of, of a message. And, that, and that's how you end up position. talking about the Tories being... Because I, I can fill in the gaps yeah. perfectly easily for, for how that plays to, 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 to the right-wing extremities. But the left-wing yeah. extremities, you tell them the Tories are killing you. They're, they're, and, and there is, obviously, there are relationships between austerity policies and broader truths but but you know they've murdered 130,000 people they've killed 130,000 people that's a ticket for the ghost train right that gets me frightened it gets me angry and I probably am not going to take as much time as I should to dig into precisely how true it is because I've got to yeah. take up my cudgels and go into battle now against these yeah. murderers <laughs> Well, yeah, but the people, and, and this, is, this is the point I guess I'm trying to make is, is mm. that uh, in, in the past, without painting it in any rose colour at all, um, there was time for contemplation because people received information in a much more uh, slow way and a way that wasn't um, data fed to make them click through or make them pay attention or make them buy something or something. So people have had these neural pathways set up. Mm. You know, I mean, we're in a generation now where people have been watching and, and absorbing advertising information since they were born um, and in much more sophisticated ways than ever. You had a, call, um, a guy on the other day who was explaining, you know, uh, I think it was on your, your show, yeah. about, um, uh, you know, advertising... Uh, 
focus groups and it, all of that sort yes, of thing. Yes, no, it was. It, I mean, well, Alex Tate, you might be referring to, who set up this yeah. campaign to, to, to hold political advertising to the same standards as cat food advertising. And when well, you yeah. say those words out loud, it's quite easy to go, oh, yes, there's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Quite. And that, yeah, no, it's, it's a good point, and and that's what it appeals to. So if you take the success of advertising in the, in our very consumer driven and commercial times, and then recognise what we discovered last week about the paucity of regulation for political advertising, I think Ross's points, his arguments, become almost almost irresistible. You have to have rules in place to stop people buying cat food under false pretenses, but they can buy a politician or a po policy under false pretenses. And and perhaps, you know, it's buyer's remorse, isn't it? It, 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 it? It's when you realise that you've bought a pup, you don't get cross with the person that sold it, you get cross with the person that told you it was a pup, and then the entrenchment of tribalism goes down a level. Um, thank you, Ross. I, uh, my apologies to my texter uh, for, for, for making such boring radio, but I, I kind of think it's important. It's probably more important than pointing out yet again that no Brexiter has an argument left for why it's actually a good idea um, and, and looking instead for ways to build a bridge between us. But, of course, what I just said might be problematical. Alfie's been in touch. He says, if you want to tone the language down, listen to a recording of your own show, you come across as patronising, sarcastic and narcissistic. It is really tedious and boring. See, mate, I, I, obviously I'd, I'd struggle to pay my mortgage... But if we could make it all just patronising and sarcastic or tedious and boring, we'd, we'd be great, you know? Joe Cox wouldn't be dead. Gina Miller wouldn't be reporting today that she gets abuse in the street when she's with her children. That poster in Manchester calling for Tories effectively to be killed. These are all the opposite of patronising and sarcastic and tedious and boring. So I, I do listen back to my own show, Alfie. I, I suspect you need to invest in some OTEX. Or, of course, other ear decongestants are available. Full answers on this, because I don't know that everybody does want to, quote, dial things down. In, in the context of political language, um, uh, it is clearly very helpful to uh, Jeremy Corbyn's wing of the Labour Party to portray Conservatives as, as killing poor people or killing disabled people. It's an incredibly powerful drug. And I think it's fair to say that it's a similar journey that leads people at the other extremities of British politics to, to talk about pretty much anyone who's foreign as being a potential enemy of the national interest. And anybody who's not foreign... Uh, as being some sort of traitor to the national interest. And, and that kind of language leads, we, we know, to the worst kind of violence and terrorism. 10.50 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. And I'll say it again, they do know what they're doing. I used to watch, took a decision on this programme many, many moons ago, long before anybody listened to it, when it became quite an easy booking to book the um, so-called preacher and Jem Chowdhury. I, I, we never did. 99% uh, uh, sure we never did. I, I may have spoken to him on the programme before I decided never to speak to him again. But I, I told you, I, I realised I was sitting in the wings of the Alan Titchmarsh show on daytime television and they brought Anjem Chowdhury on like a pantomime villain and the, and the audience started booing and hissing and he was loving it. And I just thought, why are we, why are we amplifying this guy? But the, the line between genuine incitement and conduct that decent people find despicable is incredibly thin. And Anjem Chowdhury, as a trained lawyer, knew exactly where it was. He crossed it in the end, but he knew exactly where it was. And it seemed to me... So thinking back of names that pop into your head when you're wondering whether we're living in a period of of uncommon nastiness and, and, and unpleasantness, his, his is a name that definitely pops into my head. And that that acute understanding of what is criminal and what is merely gross um, was absolutely intrinsic to his, quote, success, end quotes. You saw the same thing this weekend when Farage talked about taking a knife to the civil service and then some sort of half-hearted um, reversal claiming I should have said axe, uh, whatever it may be. All of the people on social, line, social media complaining about... Um, uh, his conduct and suggesting the police should get involved had a much less acute understanding of the line between criminality and mere 
grossness than, than he has. Um, 10.52 is the time. Now, I'm sorry, I didn't realise you were on the line. David Locke, you see, is a former Labour MP and indeed a former Justice Minister. But more pertinently, he was on Twitter yesterday in response to that Mail on Sunday suggestion that the so-called Ben Bill had been in some way influenced by foreign... Um, politicians. Uh, David took to Twitter to say, well, I, I was heavily involved in drafting it, and therefore I thought it would be worth hearing him today. Um, I, I, to sort of expand upon what you tweeted, David, it, it, you didn't recognise anything on the front page of the Mail on Sunday yesterday as being relevant to the bill that you helped to draft. Yeah, it's total nonsense. Um, the source, um, I, I, I drafted it at home in the desk. I'm sitting in at the moment um, in Worcestershire. Um, and it didn't sprout from Brussels at all. Um, it's, um, uh, it came from a group of UK lawyers who frankly agreed with Michael Gove that the referendum gave no mandate for a no-deal Brexit. <laughs> That's right. The, the, the answer is to um, uh, put a system of laws in that make, sh make sure that, uh, there is a, that there is either a deal that Parliament signs up to or an extension to give time for more, di for more discussion. And, and when you read yesterday that the, 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 the bill had somehow been influenced or, or uh, by, by... I mean, it was a, a... I hesitate almost to use the word journalism because down in about paragraph 406, it said that Downing Street failed to provide any evidence whatsoever of, of, of this claim, which was probably the most pertinent paragraph. But I need to ask whether or not after you and your colleagues had, had done your thing, whether or not it, 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 there could be a scintilla of truth in the idea that it was then boosted or, or, or embellished or improved by um, outside influence? Well, I can't see how that can possibly be right, no. because the, the bill that I drafted that then went to a group of UK lawyers to improve, and there's quite a lot of uh, skill in drafting um, legislation, and I started the process, but by no means was the only one. There are a number of people who, who were involved in trying to get it right. Um, that was essentially the bill that was then picked up by the politicians. What we wanted to do was to make sure that if the politicians got political agreement, they had something on a plate that would work legally to deliver that agreement. Um, so it wasn't right for us to decide whether they were going to agree, but if they did agree, we wanted to make sure they did it right in law. So that's what we were doing. And it's a UK law issue. It's got absolutely nothing to do with Europe. Frankly, I don't think anyone in Europe would have the skills necessarily to draft UK legislation. <laughs> yeah, well, because of precedent and, and, and understanding and knowledge, and all, just in case anyone thinks you were casting aspersions upon the intelligence of our, of our European no, no, friends, no, no. this is a question no, no. of knowledge no, no. and expertise. Precisely. It's knowledge and expertise, and it's very much domestic knowledge and expertise about the intricacies of parliamentary drafting. And, and you know, um, that's what we did. And the idea that this was somehow magicked from abroad in order to subvert the will of the British people, which is simply what the mail on Sunday was essentially arguing, yes. absolute nonsense. It's simply fantasy. Um, it's fake news. Um, because I can tell you, it didn't happen like that. And, and you know, because you were there. Indeed, you, you, you tweeted a photograph of the very desk at which the, 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 the drafting was done. I, this is sort of, it's not, it's not a very lawyerly question, this, so I'll apologise in advance, but how did you feel when you read that story yesterday? I laughed. Uh, well, I laughed in the basis that it was complete nonsense. And then I got angry because it's another example of putting out a sort of victim conspiracy story which if you are in that mindset of there's a great conspiracy to stop Brexit, you will jump on and believe, not because it's true, but yes. because it suits your, your perspective. So it seems to me highly irresponsible, utterly lacking in evidence, not something, for example, the BBC would ever do, I hope, because they have a code which regulates the level of evidence that has to be present before a story um, is, is reported. But the Mail on Sunday and whoever the unidentified source at number 10 mm. have no such constraint. So they can peddle this nonsense, feed the conspiracy theory, feed the lie. It's a lie, um, but, uh, and, and, but there will be large numbers of people who now believe it because it, the, the, the lie has been... Um, um, advanced. No, it's half, halfway around the world before the truth has got its trousers on, to coin a phrase. Precisely. And, and it just seems to me that, you know, initially I laughed, but afterwards I got angry. Yes.
Yes, crikey. Well, thank you for answering so honestly, because I, I was tempted to ask you, what could you say to people listening to this programme now who, who were labouring under the notion that, that there was a, a, a basis of truth or a foundation of fact in that story? But you've, you've essentially already said, I drafted the bill. So if, and that's well, the I, problem no, no, that you described. I drafted the first draft. The first draft of the bill. And then a group of people, all of whom were UK-based lawyers, some of whom were very eminent parliamentarians, mm. um, um, took my draft and improved it. And all of these types of um, exercises are a group exercise. They're a collective effort. No one person is, is, is ever responsible for something as complex as this. But the... But if you ask me, but what was the process? It was all domestic. Was it being dictated to by Europe? No. It had nothing to do with Europe. And that, and that, that is the, the fundamental problem that you describe as uh, the reason why anger followed fast upon your, your, your laughter, is that people will choose to believe this story, regardless of the fact that the people who drafted and, 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 and completed the bill are saying that it's nonsense. That, that's an astonishing state of affairs, isn't it? This idea that, look, here is a lawyer who wrote the first draft, here is his account of what happened subsequently, here's an utterly unsourced claim in a newspaper, and then a significant swathe of the population will elect to believe the unsourced claim in a newspaper about a bill that you wrote the first draft of. I don't see how you get out of that. <laughs> I don't see what else you can give to people except David Locke, you see, describing what actually happened. Yeah, and you know, that, that, and Nobody got paid for this. No. Nobody was, was giving instructions. We were doing this because there was a shared commitment that there was no mandate for no deal. And therefore, Parliament, if they wanted to, should be able to enforce that. Um, and Parliament decided to do that. And those who were complaining about it, looking around for some conspiracy theory to try and blame others, frankly, just as the as the whole um, Brexit campaign was always run. Um, but it's simply not true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there I think we can uh, draw a line under it for now. David Lockie, see, thank you so much for your time and, and, and attention this morning. Uh, genuinely talking about social media in a very negative sense this morning, that's also why I love it. I didn't know David's name before yesterday. Um, and I noticed his tweet originally because that desk in Worcestershire that he described is in a little town just up the road from Kidderminster where I grew up. So it was the word beautifully that jumped out at me, not the word Benact. Um, but there you have it. I don't know how you deal with that. You see, and in many ways, it, it plays into what we've been talking about all morning, doesn't it? Because you now have something that is almost certainly complete nonsense. But if it's on the front page of a newspaper, how cross can you get with Auntie Doris for thinking that it must be true? I don't know. I suspect you can get a little bit crosser with her after you've spoken to the people that wrote it. But she still believes the story.